magical treasure has always been an important part of Dungeons and Dragons, and many popular magic items in the game today were first written back in the 1970s. Okay, Eye of Vecna, done. Let's see, Eye of, uh... No, I eyes of yes. The wearer is turned to stone. Got but there were some weird magic items back then, including six legendary D and D magic items published in Gary Gygax's Dungeon Master's Guide that haven't been republished in the last 30 years. Hey, hold on there. I wrote that book over 40 years ago, not 30. Yes, but it turns out that all of the... Wait, you're supposed to be in a flashback. How do you know what year it is? Well, you're the one who wrote this script. <laughs> oh, yeah. So it turns out that all the magic items in this book were republished in the second edition, Dungeon Master's Guide, except for the items on a special list, literally, Gary's special list of the most powerful and rare items in the game, the relics and artifacts, like the hand and eye of Vecna. He even wanted you to write in the book each artifact's actual powers and effects, so that from one game to another, the players would never know the true properties of these legendary items. What a sneaky devil. Thank you, thank you. But I do not condone devil worship. Please stop saying that. But then these special, unknowable artifacts were fully described in the 2E Book of Artifacts in 1993. And people must have loved it because over the last 30 years, all of these special items have been published over and over again, edition after edition, except for one reason or another, six of these classic D&D artifacts were left in 1993 and have not reappeared in a major D&D rulebook since. At least as far as I can tell after a couple hours of painstaking Googling, seriously, I'm used to all D&D 5e lore just being immediately available in text and video format online, so this felt like a ridiculous research project. Number one, Baba Yaga's Hut. It first appeared all the way back in the 1976 booklet Eldritch Wizardry by Gary Gygax and Brian Bloom. Of course, Baba Yaga is originally a powerful, hag-like entity of Slavic folklore, sometimes flying around in a giant mortar and pestle, sometimes eating children, sometimes being helpful, and sometimes residing in a creepy hut that stands on two massive bird legs. Eldritch Wizardry defines the hut's speed and attacks and adds the interior of this hut, however, is 10 times the outer diameter. It is filled with rich furnishings and minor magical items, and its walls are equal to stone five feet thick. Definitely not your average hut. While this booklet leaves room for the reader to write in the hut's actual powers, the authors make one suggestion from table 4H. User cannot touch or be touched by any type of metal, which would be a pretty big downside to having this otherwise awesome portable base of operations. But in the first edition DMG, Baba Yaga's hut becomes even more like a living creature with intelligence high and human senses, plus infravisual ability to 120 feet and ultravision. Basically seeing into the infrared spectrum like Predator and the ultraviolet spectrum like a cop on CSI. God. Like a Jackson Pollock painting. The one E hut can obey commands from one person and be summoned from as far away as one league because Gygax loved lesser used units of measurement. And like I mentioned earlier, Gygax suggests randomly determining a few more powers from several different random tables. But then the 2E book of artifacts provides tons of detail on everything from the palace rooms to its speed and attacks and includes a curse. Baba Yaga herself will return at some point to reclaim her home. And I love these suggested means of destruction. The interior pocket dimension must be swallowed into another one. Very smart. Or the hut's hidden inner brain must be found and destroyed. So this thing is 
really more like a creature than an item at this point, and therefore it makes sense that it hasn't reappeared as a magic item since. But this hut was the star of a 2E adventure module, The Dancing Hut of Baba Yaga by Lisa Smedman, and Wikipedia has the conclusion of a review at the time saying, sure, it's a glorified dungeon crawl, but it's a dungeon crawl of transcendent proportions. How many dungeons do you know that lead to an alternate reality, Tokyo? So that seems pretty wild. Definitely let me know down in the comments if you've played that module or if you feel inspired to use the hut in your own campaign today. While I tell you about this video's awesome sponsor. Oh, I got this one, Bob. Look, if your players have gotten too cocky walking through doorways and down corridors without relentlessly tapping a 10-foot pole, you need to crank up the tension with Grimtooth's Old School Traps. 150 traps curated from classic books and redesigned in two hardcover tomes for 5e and for Dungeon Crawl Classics with essays by RPG industry luminaries. Why didn't they, why didn't they ask me to write one? Use the referral link below so they know who sent you, or this arcane code. No, Gary, it's QR code, not arcane. And check out Grimtooth's old school traps on Backer Kit today. Lost legendary magic item number two, the Horn of Change. This item has the shortest description of all the artifacts in Eldritch Wizardry. Three blasts on this horn will cause a variety of things at random. <laughs> Each time the horn is used, roll a die to determine which table will be consulted, and then roll again to see which of the effects will take place. That's it. Blow horn, completely random effect. Fireball. And it didn't change much over time. In 1E, Gygax distinguished between blowing the horn one, two, or three times, triggering effects from different tables, and the 2E version basically reverted back to the original. But the Book of Artifacts also adds a cool backstory about a mysterious stranger, mysterious stranger, probably a god, losing the horn to a suspiciously lucky gambler, but the horn is cursed. Each day a person carries it, they have a cumulative 1% chance of being seized by a gambling fever that only ends if they give up or lose the horn. So at a minimum, I feel like to lose the horn should become a euphemism for being really, really bad at gambling which also provides the perfect situation for a sad horn sound effect. The Horn of Change. Incredibly simple item, but I really like it. Why not have at least one magic artifact in the game with completely random effects? I mean, maybe it was deemed too chaotic and not as cool as the similarly chaotic Deck of Many Things. Actually, this is also the problem with the third of our six abandoned artifacts, Kuroth's Quill. This item first appeared in the 1E DMG, and for a legendary artifact, it doesn't seem very powerful in this edition. Like, at all. The text says it was owned by Kuroth, a master thief, and that it simply draws and writes infallibly on command, depicting whatever its possessor sees or speaks accordingly. It also is supposed to be able to find treasure as potion of treasure finding one time per month. So it's really good at writing and drawing and it works like a potion once per month. Yeah, this item really relied on the DM to make it special until second edition when it became the most game-breaking official item that I've ever heard of. Quote, Kiroth's Quill has the power to alter the course of a campaign. It is the equivalent of giving a character an unlimited number of twisted wishes. For this reason, the player character should have limited or no contact with the quill and should strive to prevent anyone else from using it as well. Why? Why then is this even a thing? Nah, I'm kidding. A fantasy game needs at least one item like this. And after my video about the deck of many things, we should all be on the same page that the deck is not a campaign ender too chaotic item for a campaign. Heck, especially now that Wizards of the Coast is changing some of the cards and adding a ton of new cards anyway. The deck is out, the quill is in, the pen is mightier than the cards. Okay, the only downside is that the wishes must be written down and interpreted literally, and it cannot create new things. 
so if the PCs wish for treasure, they may be teleported inside a king's treasury. But yeah, basically infinite wishes, definitely worse than the deck of many things, so I totally understand why this item stopped being published. But it would still be cool to see a module where the goal is to destroy the quill. Or maybe just some kind of reference to Kiros Thieves Guild somewhere in the book today. Like how this next item gets a little recognition in 5e. Tucked away in the Infernal Machine rebuild on D&D Beyond, we get this line. Sayadora is a gemsmith who studied under Zaggy, the mysterious figure who crafted such masterpiece artifacts as Queen Alyssa's Marvelous Nightingale. More on Zaggy in a minute. This item is pretty detailed in Eldritch Wizardry, describing how the mechanical bird can apparently shoot colorful, magical lasers from its eyes and sing pretty songs, all with different effects, and how its cage can project a 30-foot radius force field that prevents magical detection, prevents anyone inside from feeling hunger or thirst, and it has the following suggested effects. Detect evil, speak with animals, generate a double effect slow spell twice a day, there is an increasing chance that the power confined in the object will break free, take over the wielder of the item by destroying this individual's soul, then masquerading as the person, kill all of the hirelings and associates of the person. More like Alyssa's murderous nightingale. No, that's just bad. <laughs> so this is an incredibly powerful and menacing artifact. It says, Queen Alyssa bent all to her will with the enchantments of the device, and throughout her reign of several centuries, the Nightingale never escaped its confinement. And we get one extra line of lore. The origin of this artifact is unknown, although the mage Mordenkainen is reported to have asserted that the Nightingale was made by Zaggy and the goddess of volcanic activity, Joromi, some 17 centuries ago. And now you gotta follow me on a little tangent here. You may know, the mage Mordenkainen was Gygax's very own player character, and we can safely assume, I think, that Zaggy was another one of Gygax's many self-inserts. But on a little hunch, I jumped to his Wikipedia page and learned that he had a daughter named Elise, probably our Queen Elisa, and his first wife's name was Mary Jo, which happens to be an anagram of this Joramy, goddess of volcanic activity. And I thought, haha, isn't that funny? Reimagining his wife as a goddess of volcanoes. Until I googled Joramy, domains, destruction, fire, war. Her portfolio, fire, volcanoes, wrath, anger, quarrels. Other titles include the shrew, the raging volcano. Like, oh my God, Gary, this was either a cry for help or a really horrible way to immortalize his ex-wife in a fictional universe. Yikes. But in 2e, there's nothing about Zaggy or Joramy, and Queen Alyssa, formally bending all subjects to her will, gets a total makeover. Last in a line of benevolent rulers, Queen Alyssa treated everyone in her domain fairly, and no one lived in poverty or want. Now the item has five different songs with unique spell effects, and it curses the user to become increasingly childlike fleeing from monsters, being so scared that they can't sleep, always speaking the complete truth, and also losing a character level every single month. So where Kiroth's quill went from being borderline undesirable to utterly game-breaking, Queen Alyssa's Marvelous Nightingale went from being borderline game-breaking to utterly undesirable. <laughs> if this legendary artifact ever comes back, I hope it would be as originally intended but just leave out the parts about Zaggy and Joramy. Fortunately, item number five started awesome and stayed awesome. The Recorder of Ysind first appeared in the 1E DMG as a magical wind instrument that can play all by itself, plays an alarm if anyone steals anything from the owner, and can actually communicate events it has witnessed and even cast spells all through its music. This artifact sounds like a bard's dream, and the 2E version is pretty much the same, except it can communicate through visual illusions to reveal truths about the user's life, whether or not it witnessed the event. And the only downside is that the music is so beautiful that the user becomes unable to hear anything except the recorder. But like, only being able to hear music so beautiful that it drowns out everything else is a lot better of a penalty than, oh, I don't know, losing a level every month 
wishes gone bad, gambling fever, or being hunted by Baba Yaga herself, who, by the way, is written to be one of the most powerful spellcasters in existence. The only weird part is that none of these entries mention anything about Yisin, the elvish deity it's named after. But overall, I have no idea why this item would have been left in second edition. It's fun, it's not game-breaking, if anything, maybe it's slightly underwhelming for a legendary artifact, but I feel like it could come back today and people would love it. Not so sure about this last one though. Number six, the throne of the gods. This massive gold inlaid throne was crafted by an ancient race to honor their gods. It is carved into the heart of a mountain and cannot be moved. Oh, what about by magic? Even magically, because it is still part of the mountain. In 1E, the throne was rewritten with the same general description, and in 2E, they took care of that goofy magical removal part by stating that an anti-magic shell surrounds the throne, but doesn't actually affect the throne, and they gave it two main powers. 85% of the time, the throne can provide a magic item or increase one ability score by three points to a max of 20, as long as you ask it in character. Kinda needlessly specific, but okay. The other 15% of the time, the throne sitter gets minus one to all ability scores, a cursed item, or teleported 10 miles away. And trying to use the throne multiple times can get you teleported right into a battle with a god, or a more specific penalty based on your additional request. And it's pretty much impossible to destroy. This item is interesting because it's the only magic item I know of that can't be taken with the party at least as written. So I see why this didn't show up in future magic item sections of books. Really, unless D&D finally publishes a new high-level module or maybe a supplement for high-level characters, I don't think we'll ever see the throne of the gods again. But let me know what you think down in the comments and then check out this video on your screen about some forgotten old-school D&D monsters. And remember to give this video a thumbs up and share it with your game group and join the amazing community on Patreon to help make these videos possible, get into the private Discord, get cool 5e resources every month, and even bonus videos depending on your tier. But however you can support right now, thank you and keep building. That voice changed a million times throughout this <laughs> recording.